Senator Reid, thanks for taking the time to talk with us before Election Day. Thank you very much, Ted. So let's start uh, with the obvious question. You are seeking another term. You're, uh, you're actually hitting 30 years in Congress when we include your time in the U.S. House. It's a long time to be doing any kind of job, but do you still feel you know, the energy, the enthusiasm for this work that you did uh, when Rhode Island first sent you to the House? I actually do, and it's a result of uh, being lucky enough and privileged enough to represent Rhode Islanders who are decent, hardworking people, and trying to do my best for the people of Rhode Island is something that motivates me every day and, and inspires me. And I, you know, again, the inspiration comes from the people I serve. So um, I want to ask you to reflect a little bit as you seek another term, kind of look back, look forward. Um, what do you consider, again, you've, you've been in Congress quite a while, what do you consider your biggest accomplishment? What are you most proud of that you've done in your time in Congress? Well, there are several things. Uh, during the debate on the war in Iraq, it was contentious and I decided that it would be, I think, a strategic error for the United States to enter that conflict. And I was one of 22 senators who voted against it. And I think history has shown that uh, I was more accurate uh, than some others, but that's one issue. But one of the things I take pride in is, is being able to give Rhode Island sort of the resources it needs to create opportunities for its citizens. Uh, we've worked very hard in terms of transportation, and I'm the ranking Democrat on the Appropriations Subcommittee for Transportation to provide money for bridges, provide money for roads. You've, you're probably seeing lots of road work around Rhode Island these days, and that's a result of some of the extra money we've been able to get from Washington. And that means jobs too, good jobs. We did the same thing in electric boat in terms of working over these 30 years and getting to a point where I I've seen the whole process from when they tried to cancel the Sea Wolf in 1991 all the way up now to we're building two attack submarines a year and we're starting a new ballistic submarine, the Columbia class. Thousands of jobs and good opportunities again. But we have to continue to, to focus on pre preparing our, our neighbors and friends for these jobs. Uh, that means education, uh, helping in education. And then uh, I, there's gratification in doing things like getting additional resources for lead abatement in, in homes in Rhode Island, low-income homes, helping out as I did in after the recession in 08 and 09 with the hardest hit funds. So we provided resources to prevent people from losing their homes through uh, mortgage foreclosures. So generally, it's the most gratification is, is helping individual Rhode Islanders. So I want to ask you a little about the news of the day down there. And that means we have to talk about the Supreme Court. Um, we've we focused a lot on Senator Whitehouse because he's on the Judiciary Committee. But of course, you'll have a vote too uh, once it gets out of the committee. First, the obvious question, just have you made up your mind? You're going to vote against, as I presume you will, Amy Coney Barrett. Well, I voted against uh, Judge Barrett when she was put up for the circuit court based on her jurisprudence and her, her, her records in terms of what's most concern to me is she doesn't accord the same degree of uh, weight to precedent as her colleagues on the court, uh, I, I, including some of her Republican colleagues. And I think as a result, she could be more likely to dismiss established precedents than uh, other judges. Uh, so this was after reviewing her record quite carefully. She's a very talented woman. She's the, you know, uh, but it's just a difference in sort of uh, jurisprudential viewpoint. So uh, every Democrat uh, is dancing around this question, but I have to uh, I have to try to get an answer out of you. I, you know, we're talking about court packing, court reform, mm -hmm. whatever term you want to use, adding more seats to the court because Democrats, in many cases, are very upset that this seat is being confirmed so late in the electoral process. Mm -hmm. Senator, I've covered you a long time. You're an institutionalist. You were hesitant about calls for reforming the filibuster, for example. It is hard for me to imagine you, you know, beating the band to, uh, you know, do something as, as, as big a change as uh, adding more justices to the Supreme Court. Is that fair or is that something you're open to? No, I think, first of all, uh, we're concentrating on uh, winning back the Senate and the presidency. Uh, if we don't do that, then this whole discussion is totally academic. So that's the first step. And that's the focus we have right now. Uh, going forward, I think one is, uh, like so many issues, uh, you have to listen to the people of Rhode Island to see what their 
perception is. Uh, and then two, I think you have to look at how the court behaves. Uh, if it becomes a, a, a partisan institution, clearly partisan, rejecting uh, settled precedents, rejecting sort of what everyone, both sides of the aisle, consider to be the war, then I think that raises an issue that, that we have to address. But uh, those are two factors that I think have to be considered. And again, before this election is concluded, I don't think we're into that sort of consideration. I want to ask you too, I just alluded to it, but uh, the filibuster is something, uh, if Democrats were to take back the majority, I think there might be a little higher, uh, more discussion around that based on how the Senate has operated in recent years. And there was a big debate last time you were in the majority on that. Where is your head at right now on potentially either scrapping the filibuster entirely or making some major changes so it's easier to pass legislation with majority votes instead of super majorities? Well, I think first, you know, you have to uh, hope for and try to encourage bipartisan participation. We have ch uh, challenges that face this nation that aren't Democratic or Republican. They are national challenges. We're trying to get this COVID bill through right now so we can put, provide some relief for Rhode Island businesses, uh, particularly and individuals in Rhode Island. Uh, and we're not getting the kind of cooperation that we, we should. Senator McConnell announced that, you know, even though the president seems to want it and Secretary Mnuchin seems to be wanted, want it, he's not going to allow it to come up before the uh, election, and we need to help right now. So I think, though, if there is a, a Democratic victory, if we are in a position of, of authority, our first step should be try to encourage cooperation. And if we don't get cooperation, if sensible, necessary, in fact, urgent legislation is stopped, then, then we can think about that. But the first step is trying to pursue, I think, a, a bipartisan cooperative approach. Do you think uh, talking about the, um, the, I almost said the CARES Act, the whatever we're going to call the next bill, if, if and when there's another uh, relief bill, you were very involved in the CARES Act negotiations. You were one of the negotiators there. This has been very much a House and White House or Treasury discussion uh, with the Senate a little more on the side of it with how much McConnell's been talking. Do you think Speaker Pelosi should have you know, just grabbed uh, the the highest White House offer that came through just to get something through and, and kind of jam up Mitch McConnell? Or do you think she's been pursuing the right strategy here to keep pushing for changes, even as it's not even clear your Senate Republican colleagues will go with what they're discussing? I think she's been absolutely correct in her, her pursuit. And if you recall, in the Cures Act, uh, Senator McConnell tried to jam through a very limited bill. We had to stop it twice procedurally. I was involved in negotiations. In fact, I was on the, the, the group that negotiated the coronavirus uh, relief fund for $1.25 billion for Rhode Island. That was a centered initiative, and we got it done. Uh, but w without a large bill, we're not going to have the impact we need. Um, and that's not just my view. That's the view of Jay Powell, who's chairman of the Federal Reserve, President Trump appointee, you know, and frankly and ironically, the president has said the same thing in one of his tweets, go big or go home. And what you have is Senator McConnell and Republican senators who don't want to do anything, frankly. They don't want to do it now. And we need it now, and we need to go big. Uh, because if we don't have that stimulus, as Chairman Powell has said, there's a danger that the recovery not only takes much longer, but it, it doesn't come back as strong and, and as robust as we want it to come back. So I think she's doing the right thing. Um, I want to go back uh, and ask a final question about your own future, because if the Democrats, uh, I always say that, you know, these Senate elections matter twice for you. Your, your own reelection is up. And I know you'll say you don't want to presume anything. But if you were to win reelection and if the Democrats were to win the majority, you would finally become the Armed Services Committee chairman uh, based on the seniority in that committee right now. You know. I guess, like, how, I, you know, to the extent I can get you to say anything about a hypothetical, how do you think about, you know, how you would run that committee if you finally had the gavel, and also how you'd use that job for rounders? Well, first of all, the committee, as distinct from probably every other committee in the Senate, is strongly bipartisan. I work closely with John McCain. I've worked closely with Jim Inhofe. We're different 
perspectives on many issues, but we work together and we get legislation through. And that's a tradition. It goes back to Sam Nunn and John Warner and Carl Levin. So to maintain that tradition, I think is absolutely critical. Again, one of the few bipartisan organizations, committees in the United States Senate. So you do that and that means, you know, reaching out to the other side, uh, seeing what their, their view, views are. Uh, and again, making sure that that's done. Substantively, you've got to go through, and I would have to go through, or and I mean, Jim Inhofe, I'm sure, did this when he took over, and review the key programs of the Department of Defense. Uh, what's necessary? What has to be changed? Uh, how do we compete with uh, new rivals like China and Russia? Uh, how do we maintain a presence? And also recognizing the role, not just of military forces, but of diplomatic efforts. And we have to, I think, do more on that front. So sort of going back to basics and doing a full review and preparing yourself for the issues that are coming forward. And then you have to work with the president, obviously, uh, because they'll send up the budget first and they'll have uh, priorities uh, that they want to emphasize. So if Joe Biden, I know I said the last question, but I thought of one more. If Joe Biden wins, I, I'm sure, once again, your name will pop up uh, on lists of potential defense secretaries, you know, all of that. Uh, I've written before about why you weren't interested in the past. I just should check and ask the question. Uh, if, uh, if Joe Biden were to win and they w wanted you to consider that, would you consider uh, going over to the Pentagon and taking that job? You did serve with Joe Biden. You know him well. Uh, no, uh, I am running uh, and asking the people around to give me the privilege to serve for six more years as the United States Senator. And I, I'm doing it sincerely. I, and if elected, I hope I, if I am elected, on a, well, that'll depend on the voters of Rhode Island. Uh, I hope I have the opportunity to serve six years. All right, Senator Reid, thanks for taking the time to talk with us. Thanks, Dad. Take care.